Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to talk about our old friend John Dalton. You might remember him from early uh, atomic history, uh, the first real modern view of the atom, the billiard ball model. Uh, but he also did a lot of work with gases. And so we're going to talk about Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure, or sometimes just called Dalton's Law. And that's the idea, and it's a pretty straightforward idea, that if you increase the amount of gas in a system, then you're going to increase the pressure. Um, or the total pressure in the system is the result of the sum of the individual components. So if you have your and your friends bouncing around in a room, you know, hitting the walls, and then you add more people, there's going to be more collisions against the wall, hence the pressure is going to go up. And so you might be under one atmosphere of pressure right now, but it's the sum of all the pressures of the different gases, the nitrogen, the oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot of ramifications that we can uh, uh, explore with Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. And so <laughs> I look at a, a couple examples here. And it really is as straightforward as it sounds. And so uh, if, if we check out our atmosphere, um, we could say that the total pressure of a system is maybe 700 torr. Remember, atmospheric pressure is about 760. And so if we know the pressure of the nitrogen and then know the pressure of the oxygen and you're trying to solve a third mystery gas, then it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, you know the total and you know that the total is the sum of the parts. And notice uh, I give myself some descriptive uh, subscripts here so that I know what I'm talking about. And so the pressure total is the sum of the individual pressures. So I'm going to solve for the component and then just subtract it out. And so if I know the total pressure is 700 torr, I can subtract out the 200, subtract out the 450, and then I'm left with 50 torr. Sig fig fans out there will realize that that's not a sig fig mistake, but since it's a subtraction problem, my answer is limited to the significance of the, uh, the least column. They all end in the ones place, so my answer can only go to the ones place. Now, uh, where uh, the law of partial pressure comes in really handy is when you're collecting gases over water. Remember that one of the things over water will be water vapor itself. And, and uh, recently we talked about vapor pressure of water and how that vapor pressure is going to change at different temperatures. And so uh, they, they made this problem a little easy for you. They actually gave you the vapor pressure of water at 40 degrees Celsius. Now you could look that up on a chart. It's not that hard to do. But if I'm collecting, let's say, butane gas over water, uh, the pressure above that water is not only going to be from the butane, but it's going to be from the water vapor itself that vaporizes up based at that temperature. So if we just want to find out what the pressure of butane is, we have to subtract out the pressure of the water. Again, very straightforward. And so I know my total pressure. Notice I've given myself some descriptive variables, so I know what I'm talking about. Solve for the variable in question, and then it's just going to be simple subtraction. So I'll have 67.67 kilopascals. Again, even though 7.38 only had sig figs, this is a subtraction problem. And so I'm going to go to the hundredths place. And that's it. That's really the law of partial pressure. Since I have you, I might as well talk about mole fractions. Uh, mole fractions uh, is, is, again, not a, not a difficult idea. Probably made more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, you can find the uh, fraction of any mole if you know the, the moles of a gas over the total moles. But uh, the neat thing about the mole fraction is if you're clever, there's a lot you can do with this. Because if you're one-fourth the moles, you're also one-fourth the particles, you're one-fourth the volume, and you're one-fourth the pressure. Um, and all these things could be derived from your supercombined gas law. You know, uh, obviously Avogadro talks about the relationship between uh, moles and volume. Uh, but any of these things are related to that. And so given the information, you can really figure out a mole fraction. Um, and again, sometimes these simple ones are the hardest ones to set up. But if, I, if I'm giving one-fourth the total, then the total would be one. And so the mole fraction is one-fourth. Again, kind of straightforward. Um, so easy that it's like uh, confusing to some people. But let's look at another example here. Oxygen's 21% of the volume of the atmosphere. What's well, its mole fraction? Well, don't freak out. Remember, Avogadro's principle states that um, you know the, the volume is proportional to the amount. So if you're 21% of the uh, volume, then you'd be 21% of the moles also. And so I can solve for the mole fraction that way. Once I realize the connection there, it's really easy. 21 over 100, again, would be the mole fraction of 0.21. And so if, if you're clever, there's a lot of corners you can cut using mole fractions. Because remember, from an ideal point of view, all gases are the same. And so one of the things you run into is people giving you a bunch of gases. Uh, but really, a bunch of gases is no different than one gas. You know, It's just uh, whether that pressure is coming from one gas or 100 different gases, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same pressure. It's all the same amount. 
So remember that tip when you're doing gas law problems. Anyway, that's all for today. Uh, we'll come back next time and we'll talk about the ideal gas law and wrap this up. We'll almost wrap this up, then we'll, we'll sneak in some stoichiometry. Thanks for watching and have a great day.